we're going to talk about fetal circulation, which sounds boring, but it's actually really cool. Specifically, we're going to take a look at what happens when a baby transitions from the hotel uterati to the outside world. First, let's start with the placenta. It is basically acting like a 24-7 Uber driver for the fetus. Inside that cord, there are going to be three major vessels. There's going to be an umbilical vein that is bringing in fresh, new, oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood, and a pair of umbilical arteries that are draining away deoxygenated, nutrient-poor blood. Fun fact, this is all the fetus's blood. The mom and the baby's blood, they never mix. The placenta just brings them really close together so they can exchange things. This system means that the baby does not have to eat anything by mouth, nor use its lungs as long as it is in utero. Despite what a lot of people think, a fetus does actually practice breathing, so it is actually taking practice breaths before it ever touches the air. The thing is, is it's breathing fluid, and this produces a lot of pressure in the lungs which is great resistance when you're trying to train up breathing muscles, but lungs that are filled with fluid aren't very good at exchanging oxygen when you enter the world. So step one is all that fluid has to get out of there. Luckily, nature helps a lot with this because there's a muscular sac, the uterus, compressing that infant the whole time, pushing all of that water out of their lungs. If everything proceeds naturally, you also get squeezed through the birth canal, which furthers that process. If things go sideways, you may exit through the sunroof, a C-section, and need some manual stimulation, suctioning, squeezing, to get all of that out of there. Then comes the cry, which is actually preceded by a gasp. <gasps> that sudden inspiration of highly oxygenated air causes the lungs to inflate. As they inflate, they also expose the interior of the lung to oxygen for the first time. This oxygen, plus the fact that there's not fluid inside the lung, allows those little arteries to expand for the first time. Here's where it gets weird. Prior to that first breath, the lungs were basically being treated like a warp level. The body doesn't need to send blood to them, so it's not. It's just skipping them. This skipping effect has everything to do with the fact that the pressure was so high in those little arterioles. Physically, the blood just couldn't go through there. Let's shift gears for just a second. From the beginning of the video, you know that the umbilical vein is bringing in fresh new blood from the placenta. But how exactly is it getting to the heart? If you look down, you will see its entry point, your belly button. That is where the umbilical cord attaches to you. Once it's inside, the umbilical vein heads up to the liver. Once it's there, it actually bifurcates, which is just a fancy word for splits. One of these splits is really small and just heads directly to the liver to feed it. The other portion is known as something called the ductus venosus. It heads a little further up directly into your inferior vena cava, which is a gigantic vessel that takes blood to, you guessed it, your heart. If you think this all sounds weird and complicated, it's about to get more bizarre. Your inferior vena cava dumps directly into the right atrium of your heart. In you, right now, normally it would be squeezed down into the right ventricle, then squeezed again to head to the lungs. But we know that the pressure in the lungs right now is very high, and so there's not a lot of blood going there. So right now, we've got blood coming in from the inferior vena cava, a right atrium that is squeezing, but it has nowhere to send that blood. Enter the foramen ovale, which always sounds like a Harry Potter spell, but it actually means a hole that is oval, which isn't really helpful because it's not actually a hole, it's more like a valve. In either case, it connects the right atrium of the heart to the left atrium of the heart. So now, when that right atrium squeezes, the majority of that blood is now directed up through that trap door. Once it's on the left side, it will be squeezed down into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle, out up through the aorta and into the body. Back to that right atrium for just a second. When we were here, I said the majority of the blood went through the foramen ovale, but some of it actually gets squeezed down into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it still wants to head to the lungs, but again, the pressure is too high before you're born. But not to worry, Mother Nature has installed yet another warp gate. In the pulmonary arteries, just the arteries that are headed toward the lungs, there is a little tunnel known as the ductus arteriosus, which just links together the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. So no matter which way that blood that's coming in from the placenta goes, it ends up in the aorta and headed out to the body. 
But what happens to all of this once a baby takes their first breath? Well, things have to change, and they have to change fast. As soon as the lungs inflate and there's oxygen in the system, the pressure on the right side, the pulmonary side, the side that sends all the blood to the lungs, drops dramatically. This drop in pressure now means that that blood can flow openly to the lungs. But you might also be remembering that there's still a hole in the heart. And this is part of the reason why I said it's not helpful to think of it as a hole. Think of it as a valve or a trap door. See, once the pressure on the right side goes down, the pressure on the left side increases dramatically. And if everything is working correctly, the foramen ovale does not allow backflow from the left side to the right side. It's a one-way gate. And within the first few days of birth, just from that constant pressure of being pushed against the wall, it actually all heals together, and there is no more hole. A similar thing happens to the ductus arteriosus, that little shortcut between the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. If things don't proceed in a normal fashion, you can end up with conditions that need correction. And oddly, this is connected to the reason why you can't take certain NSAIDs while you're pregnant. And that's because things like ibuprofen can cause the ductus arteriosus to close up too soon. Now let's head back over to the placenta and address the umbilical cord because there's a lot of blood involved there and all of that has to stop too. Immediately after birth, the cord will actually still be pulsing. In the old days, they might still cut it while it was doing that. Now, thanks to research and evidence, there's a move toward delayed cord clamping, which allows more of the blood to return to the fetus. But no matter what, somewhere between one and five minutes, this system is gonna shut down. And this is due in large part to the fact that the placenta will detach and oxygen levels through that vascular system, through the placental vascular system, are going to drop dramatically. And when you drop the O2 level inside of an artery, just like what we talked about in the lungs, they will constrict. And that is part of what happens to the umbilical vein. It just constricts because there's no oxygen there. There's also this really weird substance inside of the umbilical cord called Wharton's jelly. When you need a good jelly, think Wharton's. When this jelly is exposed to the air, it starts to harden and constrict. This is just another mechanism that turns off all of that blood flow and prevents hemorrhaging. And this constriction and eventual atrophy continues all the way up into the actual baby's body. That is why you will find remnants of these structures in your adult body. These leftovers include structures like the right and left medial ligaments, seen here. Then there's the median umbilical ligament, which is actually a remnant of a remnant, because it's actually derived from a structure when you still had a yolk sac called the allantois. And finally, you have ligamentum teres, another Harry Potter spell. It's also known as the round ligament of the liver. A crazy and creepy thing that can happen with this is it can actually recannulize, like open back up. This is caused by something called portal hypertension and leads to a really disturbing condition called caput medusae, or Medusa's head, where you end up with dilated and swollen vessels all around your belly button. Ooh, I know that was a long one, and I appreciate you for sticking around for it. And as your reward, one of my favorite dad jokes coming at ya. What would bears be without bees? Ears. It's such a stupid joke, but I got one more for you. What do you, what do you call a pile of kittens? A meowtin. I'll see myself out. Thank you for learning with me. And if you've got a question, you know what to do.